Today's talk will be about controlling weeds, presented by Carrie Wimbill Rojas. Carrie is the Associate Director for Urban and Community IPM and also an Area Urban IPM Advisor serving Yolo, Solano, and Sacramento counties. As Associate Director, Carrie provides leadership and coordinates communication and educational efforts to address pest issues around homes, structures, landscapes, gardens, schools, and public areas. Carrie, you may now sh uh, share your slides. And unmute myself. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you for joining us today. Last I looked, we had about 190 people on um, as of right now. Um, so today we are going to be talking about um, controlling or managing weeds in the landscape, um, lawn and landscape around the home. And I have quite a bit to share with you, so I'm just going to get to it. First, we'd like to make sure that we are all understanding what a weed is. And uh, different people think of plants in different ways. So a weed is really just a plant that you don't want growing in an area. But if it doesn't bother you or your clientele, if you do any kind of you know, landscape maintenance, then perhaps it's not a weed. So what makes a pest a pest is sometimes personal. So if you think it's pretty and you want it to grow there, then perhaps it's not a weed. But when you find that something is, a weed in your landscape and you don't want it, that's when we talk about managing them. Now, this webinar is not going over identification of weeds, um, but I do want to just, you know, have a little baseline here that weeds that we're talking about, plants that we're talking about are in three categories, broadleaves, grasses, and sedges. There are also aquatic weeds, but um, I'm not talking about those today. If you wanted uh, information on identifying weeds, um, you can see the UCIPM uh, recorded webinars on YouTube, and we had an excellent presentation in November of last year, 2021, on weed identification by our colleague, John Ron Caroni. And Belinda or Petter will put the link in the chat for you. So without getting into too much of weed identification, um, it is important to know your your weed and how it grows because some weeds are more successful at growing and becoming weeds and really spreading than others. Uh, some plants are very competitive and have the potential to be invasive. And in those kinds of characteristics, they may reproduce and spread very quickly. And different weeds spread by different structures. Some spread by seeds, and some grow in a what we call vegetative way that they they crawl or creep or um, have underground structures that allow them to spread by tubers or above ground um, root type structures called stolons or underground really thick um, roots called rhizomes. And so um, these kinds of growth structures will allow weeds to take over an area. Um, if we don't employ some of the things we'll be talking about today. So in understanding the type of weed you have, that entails understanding its life cycle. So you want to control weeds before they start to spread, and you want to do that at the right stage of the weed growth. Typically, this is when the weed is going to be a really young or small weed, and not when it's a very mature plant and definitely um, control it before it flowers and produces seeds, if it's a seed producing and spreading weed. Um, your best success at control is going to be at the younger stage of the plant. And so our, our successful management will depend on lots of different factors that we'll talk about today. Can we do things that are going to prevent weeds from becoming a problem? Are there pre-planting uh, uh, practices we can do. Uh, before a weed emerges, can we grow some things that are going to be more competitive? Can we use mulches? And then after the plants, the weed emerges, then how do we control them there? So we will talk about a lot of the um, aspects on this screen today and how to get the best control of uh, weeds in general. I will mention um, we cannot 
talk about specific weed problems today. I do have some examples at the end, but there are so many different weeds we could talk about, but I'm going to share with you at the end of the presentation resources for you to find out more, uh, where to find more information on specific weeds. So lastly, on um, understanding weeds, you also want to consider whether it's an annual weed, does it go through its entire life cycle in one year or one season, or is it a perennial in that it continues to grow year after year? That is also going to be important in managing the weed successfully. So when we do uh, find that we have a weed that you need to uh, control or manage, we use what is known as integrated pest management or IPM. IPM is a science-based concept that um, entails the combination of complementary pest control practices and methods that we want to try and focus on the long-term prevention of a pest and combine these different practices that we'll talk about today to get at the best control or suppression of the weeds. Uh, in integrated pest management, we often caution people that there's no silver bullet. There's no one answer. What's the one thing I can do to never have crabgrass again? I think if I had that answer, I would be a millionaire. But we do have many different con control strategies that um, when in used in combination are going to get us the best kind of control. And those include cultural controls, which I'll um, explain momentarily physical or mechanical controls, biological control, and chemical control or the use of pesticides. So here are some examples of weed control options, and we don't have time today to go through all of these, but I will touch upon a number of them. So we have um, prevention. How can we prevent weeds from becoming established or continuing to be a problem in the area? Can we clean things up so it's not so weedy or maybe it just doesn't look as weedy, um, but we can still you know, have some weeds and be okay with it. Growing a cover crop, um, using animals as biological control, um, tilling the, the soil to um, you know, move the, the plant material underneath the ground. We of course have mowing and string trimmers, use of mulch, flame and steam weeders, uh, solarization, and lastly, herbicides. So I'll talk about many of these, but not, not all of them today. So first I wanna talk about cultural control because with weeds, um, uh, modifying the habitat that allows the plants, the unwanted plants to grow is going to be very important. What cultural controls are, are practices that alter the conditions that might be favorable to a plant and altering them so that the the pest or the plant is not going to um, be successful. So you can do things to reduce. Can you reduce the weed establishment? Can you reduce bringing in or introducing weed seeds or allowing um, weed seeds to come into an area? Can you also reduce the plant reproduction? Um, you know, getting rid of uh, the flowering structure before it sets seeds. Um, can you reduce the dispersal of weed seeds and then the survival of the weed itself? So these are all considerations for um, cultural controls. So in preventing the establishment or the introduction of weeds, if you're going to be planting a new area, uh, which is not always the case, but there are things that you can do in a landscape to give your desirable plants a head start over a weedy plant and um, encourage the establishment of the desirable plant. So first you can start with a, a really good soil that holds water and nutrients, has good drainage, and maybe is a, uh, a lighter soil that is amended before you plant your desirable plants. Then your plant choice is important, something that's going to establish quickly so that it is competitive with any weeds that might be there for the limited resources like light, space, and water. You can also choose vigorous plants that are adapted to your local conditions, which is always going to be a good choice because a plant that's gonna grow well in your area is going to be more successful and you'll have less time and inputs you have to put into it. And then plant plants that might be ground cover so that you don't have bare area. 
bare areas of soil are just an invitation for weeds to establish in that area. And um, there's other considerations for, for planting plants in an area, how much water they consume, um, whether they're native, pollinators, many different considerations that we could probably have a whole um, webinar on itself. But the other cultural considerations to think about are why are the weeds invading or why are they spreading? There are many different conditions that we can modify depending on uh, what kind of weeds we have or what kind of soil we have. Often weeds will respond to certain conditions and I'll give you some examples um, towards the end. But um, some weeds grow in really compact soil, other weeds grow in um, really wet soils, some weeds thrive in, in drought or really dry soils. So sometimes the weeds themselves can tell us what the conditions are that we need to modify. But in general, um, weeds will become established in areas that are poorly maintained, maybe not um, given much attention as far as the soil quality or mowing or you know, they might be ignored, but there may be some other underlying problems like overwatering, and certain weeds will grow in waterlogged or overwatered um, conditions. There's also drought and drought like dry areas that will favor some weeds, uh, compact soils, as I mentioned, fertility issues, and there's many other reasons why a weed would be establishing in an area. So we need to think about what's happening in order to change the conditions to have the right kind of conditions that we need. So um, one important aspect for weed control and for these cultural controls is to have the right kind of irrigation. So you wanna make sure that if, you're, um, if you've got a, a weed problem and you know there's a lot of uh, weed seeds in, in the soil, maybe install drip irrigation to only deliver water to the uh, plants that are desirable, the plants that you want to grow. Because if you have an overhead or sprinkler irrigation, it delivers water everywhere and both the desirable plants and the weedy plants will get that water that they need. So using drip irrigation will limit the um, water availability to the undesirable plants. Uh, if you do have an already established irrigation system and you're not going to switch over to, to drip, that's fine, but you wanna maintain that irrigation equipment so that there's proper coverage, especially if it's for a lawn, you don't want dry areas or um, areas that uh, are waterlogged. Um, and then you wanna make sure to inspect your system regularly and make adjustments as the season changes and irrigate only when needed. So you're trying to irrigate the desirable plants and not the weeds. So another um, aspect of prevention, but also it's a cultural control and a physical control is using mulch. And we all know about mulch, we've seen mulch, we've probably used mulch, but mulch is a layer of material that's put on the soil surface um, around your plants or instead of a plant to prevent weed growth. And there's so many different kinds of mulches that are available. There are rocks um, and their sizes may vary from small pebbles to larger uh, rocks. There are many different kinds of uh, synthetic fabrics that can be put down as an initial layer. Um, and there are of course the organic uh, mulches such as bark and, and other uh, natural materials. So all of these mulches are going to block light and suppress weed growth. And many of them will also hold moisture in, which can reduce soil compaction and erosion. And for the organic mulches, as they break down, they can also improve the soil quality. So with the organic mulch, um, there's lots of things to consider. How you want your area to look, if you want it um, very uniform, you might use a certain kind of, of mulch type. Um, and there's various sizes of mulch and different kinds of bark and, you know, a mix of bark and branches and the things that you can get at your probably local um, municipal district. Um, but there's, there's large shapes, there's fine mulches, but whatever kind you choose, you need to make sure that you have the proper um, height of that mulch. 
You might need to have three or four inches deep of mulch for certain ones, uh, fine mulches, maybe two inches deep. Um, and so do a little research on your mulch to find out if you're using this kind, how thick of a layer do you need? And that thickness is going to, you know, if you use the proper thickness, it is going to keep those weed seeds from growing at least until the mulch breaks down. Organic mulches are going to break down. They're made of, of natural products, um, materials. So when they break down, um, the layer will get thinner and you will need to replenish the mulch. And so if you start to see weeds growing through your mulch, that might be a good indication that it's time to replenish it. And so seeing those weeds growing through, you can just remove those individual weeds by hand, but keep an eye out to see, you know, if you've got some thin areas or the mulch has really started to break down or, or move around um, through any kind of disruption, um, kids walking through, you know, pets, whatever then um, time to replenish and maintain that mulch. All right, some other cultural controls. Um, again, for, for water management, it's very important. So if you have a lawn and you want to think about keeping those, those weeds down, you wanna use good um, irrigation controllers. There are lots of different, what we call smart controllers that sense um, moisture, sense the rain, and they can adjust themselves. Um, and lots of other factors too. Um, there are soil moisture meters that you can use to see how, how moist the soil is and whether you need to irrigate or not. Um, but it's very important with any kind of irrigation system that you fix any kind of leaks, any broken areas, any broken sprinkler heads. You want uniformity if you are using sprinklers, but you definitely don't want a broken sprinkler head like what's shown at the, the bottom picture here where you now have standing water. That standing water could lead to um, the growth of certain weeds. It also can lead to some plant diseases um, that you may not want. Um, and so making sure your irrigation is uniform and there are many different kinds of uh, uh, plants and lawn turf grass species that are low water requiring species. Um, and then there are some that you may uh, want the lawns to go dormant um, during the time of year that it's not actively growing. So lots of cultural considerations. Another cultural and physical control for weeds and for having healthy um, turf grass is to use an aerator. There's my other picture. So you can see in this video, hopefully, and that's, the, that's a good size aerator that's obviously on a golf course but you know he's just dragging it and it's taking plugs these little plugs right here out of the soil and this allows moisture to get in and it allows some um, some aeration of the soil which is good for the growing turf grass and so a healthy turf grass is going to better compete with any weeds you can certainly uh, rent these from some of the um, landscape uh, stores and some of the box stores, you can buy one. And then there's also handheld little aerators that you can um, use as well. I've even seen shoes with spikes. I'm not sure how well those work. But anyway, um, aerating may be good, especially for compacted soils and, and turf grass. And another thing for lawns is a cultural control of managing your fertility, the nutrients in the soil. So you want to have the right kind of nutrients that your turf grass needs and the timing of it is critical. So you want to apply any kind of fertilizer at the time that the turf grass is actively growing. This also would be for plants that need fertilizer. You want to fertilize at the time that the plant is actively growing and making sure that you do a soil test to see what nutrients you are lacking. There's so many different kinds of soils in California. And if you're joining us from another state, uh, same thing. There's so many different soils um, uh, in our country that you want to make sure what nutrients you are, uh, your plants are lacking, and then look into it before you go and grab a product. Um, and again, for turf grasses, there are some low input species that you can grow that don't require uh, quite as much um, fertilizer inputs. 
So lastly, on cultural controls before we move into physical controls, um, using a, um, a lawnmower or a string trimmer is going to be important as a physical control to cut back the weed before it flowers and produces seeds. By doing that, you are reducing the dispersal of the seeds and the future uh, establishment of weeds by, uh, by seed. Now, not all plants, not all weeds do reproduce by seed. So again, knowing what kind of plant you have is going to be important for its management, uh, what kind of weed you have. But some grasses, if you're growing a lawn, the turf grass mowing height is really important for the health of that turf and for um, having an established and healthy turf grass, it's again going to be um, more competitive with any weedy um, plants that try to grow in. So uh, this is a table right here from our uh, crabgrass resource called the IPM Pest Notes series. And so this shows the proper mowing height for different turf grass species, the things you want to grow uh, to make it not uh, a uh, not favorable for crabgrass to grow um, as the competitive weed. So this may be different for different um, uh, weed species. And uh, towards the end, I will show you some of the UCIPM resources that we have to help you answer some of these questions. All right, so into physical controls. Certainly we can pull out every weed we see that we don't want. That's easy to say and not always easy to do. Uh, if the ground is really dry or compact, it may be very difficult to get that weed out of the ground. But we can certainly use physical tools to remove weeds. Um, removing them from the mulch as you see them, maybe there's just one. This one looks like it's been growing there for a while, but you can remove them as you see them growing in the garden, in the landscape, in the lawn. But you do want to remove them. Remember, it's best to um, do your weed control when the weeds are relatively young in the seedling or, you know, uh, the, the young stage of growth before it's a mature plant. It's going to be easier to remove if it's not a full mature plant, and you also don't want it to set seed and establish some of the structures for it to spread further. Um, do your best to remove the entire plant, and this again may require that you um, identify what weed you have first. There are some weeds that have really long tap roots. And if you just take off the top part of the plant, but leave the tap root, that plant will just regrow from, from the, um, the tap root in the top of the soil. So dandelion is a really good example of that. Um, south thistle, you wanna make sure to um, get the entire plant. And that can be difficult, as I said, with, with drier or compact soils. So you might want to irrigate uh, a little bit before you go to remove it to make it easier to get that taproot and the whole plant out and um, grab it at the base or use a tool. There are so many different tools available for um, our, our physical weed removal. Uh, as shown here, you can see a garden hoe, which just scrapes the top of the soil, which is great, but it may not get all of those those roots out. So certain plants will be well removed with a, a garden hoe or what's shown next to it, a hula hoe, which you just scrape back and forth or dig a little bit. But for others, you need to get that tap root out. So here at the bottom, you can see a dandelion knife. That's a kind of tool that's been around for a long time that is just kind of a fork on a, on a handle where you dig under the soil and lift out that um, that root. And there are many, many different styles that are available out there. Some have really good handles with um, good ergonomics. And um, when we share um, resources with you at the end uh, of the webinar today, we'll send you an email tomorrow that has links to some of the things we're talking about today. Um, I will include a link to uh, a study that we did on uh, various hand tools for weed removal, um, which had long handle tools and short handle tools um, as a comparison. So lots of different physical tools out there to help you dig up these structures. 
And as I mentioned earlier, some of the weeds have tubers or, or little tiny um, structures underground that you will need to remove if you're going to have a successful um, removal of, of the weed. Um, yeah, so these work really great uh, for annual weeds, especially. So a couple other physical tools uh, include steam weeders and flame weeders. For home gardeners, um, a steam weeder may not be as practical right now. These tend to be um, larger um, contraptions, uh, but I have heard people uh, controlling their weeds just by boiling some hot water and throwing it down the, uh, the driveway to, to um, burn back the weeds in the cracks. Uh, that is kind of a lot of work, but there are commercially available steam weeders that introduce steam to the weeds and it causes the cells to, to break down and the, the weed ends up dying. Same thing with the flame weeders. The flame weeder, that's what she's using at the, the bottom picture here. It's a long handled tool that attaches to a propane tank and it delivers heat, not flame. It's not a, a flame torch. Um, but it does deliver heat through this cone to the weed and same thing as with steam ends up sort of breaking down the cells in the weed and the weed ends up dilapidating. Um, I would say that this weed is a little um, more mature than what would be the best use of a flame weeder. You want to use it on younger plants um, so that they will hopefully die quicker um, because they're still growing and they're still tender. Um, and you can use it to treat uh, foliage and, and stems. You do, with any kind of flame, want to be careful around your desirable plants and also uh, around any kind of dry brush or mulch that it doesn't actually uh, start a fire. And it really just takes a, a couple of, um, you know, 20 to 30 seconds for, for less mature weeds um, to introduce that heat and then the plant breaks down. You don't have to stand there for a long time and definitely you don't want it to catch on fire. So this reminds me that not all of these tools that we talk about are going to be appropriate in all situations. You want to use a tool that's going to be appropriate in your situation where you are managing weeds. So if using a flame weeder around very flammable landscapes or potentially uh, fire hazard areas, then certainly that is not the tool that you want to use. And so we, we talk about flame weeders with precaution. I think the, the best uh, scenario to use them is in hardscapes where you've got weeds growing through cracks or on school sites where um, they don't want to necessarily apply herbicides around children. Um, and so using the, the flame weeders in the cracks is one of the uh, good non-chemical options available. All right, uh, biological control, while limited for weed control, there are animals, including insects, that are herbivores that eat weeds. Some do a really good job at clearing an area very quickly. Um, some of the uh, herbivore insects might take quite a while to um, control a, a weedy area. But here you can see um, some, some goats, and I just learned this term goatscaping uh, the other day, where using uh, a flock of goats to uh, release them caged in an area, and they will eat the plant material in that area. Um, you don't want these kinds of general herbivores around your desirable plants because they may eat plants that you want to keep. So it really does depend on what kind of weed control you're after. This was on a hill in between some newly um, established housing uh, areas and uh, it was quite weedy off to the left and you can see that the goats on the hill had done a really good job in that area and um, you can see very faintly but there's a fence in the foreground and so there are uh, companies that will uh, bring the goats to you um, i've heard about ducks eating plants as well but regardless, the, they're animals. You want to protect them from any dogs or other predators. Um, and you know, on hot days like we're experiencing now in California, making sure they've got um, other food sources and water, and um, 
You don't want them to be in, in areas where any pesticides have been applied. And then of course, um, there's cleaning up their waste afterwards. So biological control is, is an option. It's not going to be appropriate for all situations. Um, maybe not the front yard, right? <laughs> all depends. But it is one of the tools we have for, for weed management. Um, so I do want to talk about chemical control because in integrated pest management, we talk about cultural control, physical controls, biological control, and chemical control. And so there are herbicides available, which are pesticides that control weeds. And we find that with um, using herbicides, perhaps in combination with some of the non-chemical tools I've talked about up until now, will get us the best control. But if you hand weed and mulch, usually that is adequate control for what most of us need around our, our gardens and landscapes. So you want to reserve the herbicides for the special needs, for the difficult to remove weeds, for the large areas of weeds that you're trying to manage, whatever your situation may be. But you still should figure out the underlying cause. Why is this such a weedy area? Why am I continuing to have this weed or these weeds in this area? Is it something to do with the soil? Is it something to do with irrigation, right? There's there's reason for those weeds to be there. And see what you can do to use preventive methods, perhaps instead of uh, herbicides or after an herbicide have, has been applied and moving forward. But what if you decide to use an herbicide, you want to use one that is labeled for the weed species you are trying to control and is safe around your desirable plants. And this information will be on labels. I'm going to talk about labels in a second. So there are different kinds of herbicides. There are contact herbicides and systemic herbicides. The majority of the herbicides that we have in the, the home market, the consumer market, are going to be contact herbicides in that they will injure the plant material that the herbicide comes in contact with. And because of that, you need to have good spray coverage and, um, and uh, that is best done with, again, younger plants. If you have a really mature mallow, you're gonna to have to use a lot of the herbicide to um, control that. And frankly, there's not a lot of good herbicides for mallow anyway, so that's a bad example. But you need good spray coverage. And again, it's only going to work on the um, plant material, the plant parts that it touches. So if you've got one of those weeds with a good tap, uh, taproot system, that plant may regrow if the taproot tap root isn't uh, removed. Systemic herbicides work as they sound systemically. They, they travel through the system of the plant to deliver the material to all parts of the plant. So an example might be glyphosate or 2,4-D or fluazofop. Those are systemic herbicides. There are others, but not, not quite as many as the contact herbicides. And they are taken up by the green parts of the plant and then um, distributed to the other parts. So they would end up killing that, the, the root portion as well. Um, and it may take just you know, a couple of hours for a contact herbicide to show some of the plant damage, whereas a systemic herbicide might take a bit longer. Also in considering herbicides, there's pre-emergence and post-emergence. You apply a pre-emergence herbicide before the weeds have emerged from the soil. And a post-emergence, like a contact herbicide, you apply after the weeds have emerged from the soil. So that's going to be important um, when you consider when you might be using these and, and for what weeds. More and more on the market, there are organic or herbicides, and there are many different kinds of active ingredients. The material in the pesticide that, that kills or repels or controls the plant. Um, some of these are based on plant-based oils like clove oil, cinnamon oil, rosemary, etc. There's some um, pelargonic acid that's also plant-derived, and some have fatty acid chains that are referred to as herbicidal soaps. And then many people I'm sure have heard of using vinegar, but not just your household vinegar, 20% acetic acid, which is the active ingredient um, that makes up these, these vinegar products. But you have to be careful because 
Uh, some of these products actually um, uh, may burn your skin or your eyes. So you need to really read the label carefully and understand the product that you're going to use. Just because something is organically acceptable does not mean it's completely safe for us as humans because these are acids and some acids are, are stronger than others. And so precaution is always needed. Um, but these are uh, mostly contact herbicides. So they're going to be effective on young plants only post emergence, right? After the plant has emerged, um, they may not be uh, useful on plants with substantial roots or those perennial plants that grow year after year. And you may need to reapply them uh, frequently. But because they are contact sort of burn down um, materials, they may also uh, damage your desirable plants. So you have to be careful there. And some, as you can see from these plant-based oils, um, they're very fragrant. And there's a product I've used in some of my trials that is very, very strong, uh, clove and cinnamon, and it, it, um, it bothers some people. So that's just a consideration. Um, but they do have their uses for sure. And um, there's also corn gluten meal as a pre-emergent, but um, research from colleagues at UC does not back up their efficacy, that product's efficacy as a, um, an herbicide. So these organic herbicides, as I mentioned, they are contact, um, they work on any kind of plant material that they touch, um, sort of burning down that plant material, but again, only on contact. So they're not going to be effective on the roots. Um, and good spray coverage is essential, as I mentioned in that earlier slide. Um, we do know about these organic herbicides that they work best on clear sunny days when weather is 80 degrees or more. But if it's really hot outside and you use some of these oils on, on um, and it gets on desirable plants, it may actually harm the plant. So there's a, a fine, fine line there. Um, some adding a surfactant could improve the weed control. And again, repeat applications may be necessary for very weedy areas or for those larger, more um, uh, uh, mature weeds. So anytime you're using a pesticide, whether it's an herbicide, an insecticide, um, fungicide, you always want to read the pesticide label. It's very important to understand as much as you can about that product and to make sure that you're using it in a way that reduces any kind of exposure to yourself and to non-targets. So you want to um, look at various things on the label, especially the active ingredient and the directions for use and any precautionary statements. We do have a webinar on um, understanding pesticides and we'll make sure to send you that link um, uh, tomorrow when the email comes out to you. And um, always look at the, the label, but understand that herbicides, again, can injure your desirable plants. So you wanna make sure that you're thinking about what other plants are around and what their exposure might be. And to follow the label instructions, if it says, don't use this around roses and where your weeds are next to your roses, you could have some injury to your roses from that material if that's what the label states. You also wanna make sure that any kind of wind is um, minimum because the wind can carry that herbicide um, or any pesticide uh, off the, the target area. So do not apply on windy days and uh, be careful of roots that are nearby uh, roots of your desirable plants. Um, this again is just follow the label, um, make sure that your weed is listed. So again, you may need to identify your weed first, follow all the directions, use the amount that's needed. If it says one ounce per gallon, don't use two ounces per gallon. More is not better when we're talking about pesticides and um, try not to over irrigate because that could dilute the herbicide. So I didn't want to talk too much about herbicides, but um, in, in summarizing, there's lots of different uh, non-chemical tools that can be done for managing weeds in um, your landscape beds, such as you know, planting competitive plants, putting down mulches and uh, removing weeds by hand and good irrigation and maybe using physical barriers that will reduce weeds spreading by those vegetative growths from one area to another. In a hardscape area, um, you can uh, you know, build sidewalks and, and fences and other physical barriers 
that are going to keep weeds from moving from one area to another. Um, also in sidewalks and driveways, you can use those flame weeders or steam weeders or some of these tools like this weed knife to pull the weeds out um, instead of spraying them with, with an herbicide. You can also seal up cracks um, using a crack filler that is appropriate for whatever the hardscape is and um, using non-chemical tools uh, or less toxic materials to control weeds and hardscapes. Around trees, um, you can um, use mulches uh, with or without fabric barriers around the base. You don't want to pile up the mulch, though. Um, there are guidelines on using mulch around trees that we can share with you. Um, consider different kinds of mulches, and you want to remove any kind of weeds before you put the mulch down. Um, and there's, there's newspaper or cardboard. Um, you can also use compost. So there's lots of different ways of managing weeds around your desirable plants like trees. And then I think I covered lawns pretty well, but you, you want to have a, a healthy established turf grass that's going to be adaptable to your area and also that is going to um, uh, be competitive to any weeds that might want to pop through here. And I'm going to share some resources with you uh, in a moment where you can find more information. But really quickly, here's a lightning round of IPM for specific weeds. And again, we don't have time to get into all the different weeds, but I have a couple of examples of IPM um, methods for specific weeds. So white clover is a weed that some people really wanna get rid of. It's a perennial, so it'll grow year after year. Um, it does reproduce by seed and by those above ground um, kind of roots called stolons. And um, the seed coats are really hard, which means they can stay in the soil for many years. And then when the soil is tilled or the conditions are right, those weed seeds can grow. So we want to try and reduce the development of those seeds um, so that they don't stay in the soil for a long time. And uh, clovers in general grow well in areas of low nitrogen um, and they can regrow pretty, pretty fast and give a turf grass area sort of a lumpy look. Dallas grass, which is, um, to be honest, most of my front lawn, um, but hey, it's green. Um, it's a quartz textured perennial. So yes, I have it growing year after year. And it, it grows in, in pretty thick um, clumps that are a bit higher up than some of the other grasses. This one reduces, uh, reproduces by seed and you can see the, the, the seed heads here. Um, and it will also grow by um, these underground really thick rhizomes. They almost look like earthworms, these, these, um, these uh, rhizomes. Um, they are well adapted to frequent mowing, close frequent mowing. So understanding how this one grows and how you can mow it at a different height is part of its control. Um, digging or chemical controls is one of the best ways to get rid of it once it's established. And you can get the shovel and lift the whole thing here, those rhizomes, they do kind of look like worms, but you can lift, this is one whole clump of Dallas grass. So you can lift the whole thing out and then you know replace with with sod or um, seed so that the desirable turf grass um, starts to establish. But yeah, it's kind of fun to get one of the whole things up. Uh, Bermuda grass, which uh, is is a beast. It is a perennial. It reproduces by stolon or rhizome, less by seed, but it spreads really well under close mowing. And when the um, plant parts are kind of chopped up, it can reproduce by any of the plant parts. So it's it's really something that's hard to control. Um, it's drought, drought tolerant and it grow, goes dormant when temperatures drop in the fall. Um, but what's really important is a cultural kind of control is that you clean the mower um, after mowing an area with Bermuda grass so you don't move it to other areas of your landscape. Um, and then uh, planting a competitive turf grass or other kinds of competitive species. Um, and again, we have resources for each one of these uh, weeds that I'm sharing, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, annual bluegrass is another really um, uh, common weed that we find. 
Uh, it's a winter annual perennial in some places, it grows really well in cool, moist weather. And this one is really adapted to low mowing. So when you're mowing your lawn, the, the plant, which might sort of normally grow to a certain height, frequent mowing, frequent low mowing, it'll only start to grow as high as when you normally mow it. So you can kind of see here that there's the desirable turf grass and some of the, uh, the flowering uh, structures of the annual bluegrass that it's only growing as high as it's being mowed. And so it does adapt well. Um, and it does well in compacted soil. And so that's some uh, one of those conditions that you might want to change. And it does well in uh, soil with high nitrogen. And it does produce a lot of seeds. Um, this is broadleaf plantain. And it forms in a rosette. And it has, it says thick taproot, but I find that there's still a lot of little um, fine uh, roots that this one is fairly easy to pull up by hand. But if your ground is dry or compacted, it makes it much harder to get all of those roots. So um, you can remove it by hand, but just make sure that you can lift it out and get all those seed structures. Uh, this one does reproduce by seed. So um, you can mow it, but it's very low grow growing. That mowing, it doesn't really cut it down enough to control it. Um, and it does well in wet areas, although it can establish, um, do well in dry areas too. But one of its uh, reasons it's there, it's because of irregular irrigation. So again, adjusting that irrigation. So just a few more slides to tell you where you can find resources to help you in managing your weeds. And again, you can find specific um, ways to manage specific weeds on the UC IPM website. Um, here is our homepage. And if you are not in engaged in agriculture and you're one of our home garden and landscape audiences, you'll want to go to, to home garden turf and landscape pests. And then you will find there lots of different resources. But where it'll say weeds, let me see if my next slide, nope. Where it'll say weeds, you can find resources like our pest notes series where we have a general pest notes on weed management in landscapes. We also have one on weed management in lawns, but then we have specific pest notes on dandelion and Bermuda grass and Dallas grass and clovers and the list is long and the list is right here. <laughs> so um, you, can, you can click on any of these and you'll get um, identification and how to identify it um, and also uh, the conditions that favor it and how to use various cultural, physical, um, and chemical techniques for each one. We do also have a weed photo gallery to help you identify your weed and you choose by different characteristics. So like I said, plantain grows in a rosette. Choosing a rosette, if you look at your weed and it says, well, it's kind of in a, you know, it looks like a flower, um, uh, like a rosette flower then you can use that as one of your distinguishing characteristics to narrow down what kind of plant, what kind of weed you're seeing. We also have a specific key to weeds in lawns because not all the weeds that we have in the weed gallery are necessarily going to be in a lawn. And that will help you narrow down the weed you have. And then it will point you to the resource for further identifying and for understanding its life cycle and then to the resource for managing it on the UCIPM website. Uh, and again, we'll send you a link um, in tomorrow's email that uh, points you to these various resources. All the resources are available in English, uh, both in a, uh, a web version, as well as a printer-friendly PDF version. And a couple of these resources are also available in Spanish. And we use lots of pictures so that we can make sure that you're confident in um, your identification. And I did talk about uh, lawns and turf grass a bit today. We do have a resource called the UC Guide to Healthy Lawns that can help you um, establish a new lawn, uh, prepare a site, renovate, um, or care for um, an, ex uh, uh, an established lawn that's already there, and also other pests. Um, weed pests, but also insect and disease pests and things that are not pests that are abiotic issues. 
And so here's some of that. We talk about proper mowing that I mentioned today, um, good irrigation and fertilizing, and then even how to identify your turf grass species, because some of us move into a house and the turf is already there um, and we don't know what we have. So we have information to help you in that way as well. All right, I see that there are some questions and um, there's my contact information if you need more, um, more information. And I will answer some questions when Belinda tells me to. Okay, thank you, Carrie. And thank you everyone for joining us today.